Sangamitra Biswas is the executive editor and rights manager at Westland Books. So in her current role, she commissions, edits, and publishes fiction, both literary and commercial, as well as narrative nonfiction, and manages the rights for Westland's titles. She's responsible for Westland's uh, literary fiction imprint, Trankebar, under which she has published books which have been on various awards lists, like uh, Jane, is it Borges or Borges? Borges. 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 So uh, Jane Borges, Bombay Balchao. Then there is um, <clears throat> Manjul Bajaj's In Search of Heer, Manjiri Indurkar's uh, It's All in Your Head M, and Amina Ahmad's The Return of Faraz Ali. Uh, she's been with Westland for a decade and she's edited books by Amish Tripathi, Anand Neel Kanthan, who we have next weekend, by the way, Ravi Subramaniam and Christopher Doyle. Uh, she's passionate about publishing, but with a focus on debut fiction in particular, she's always on the lookout for cutting-edge non-fiction. That is music to our ears, Sangamitra. She recently published um, Jupinderjeet Singh's Who Killed Musewala, uh, which is an edge-of-the-seat account of the singer's death and the investigation around it. Amongst uh, the non-fiction titles, she's also most excited about publishing uh, next, year, next year a deeply detailed biography of Sri Devi, the Indian film star. So prior to working at Westland, she's also worked at Scholastic and OUP, Oxford University Press, where she started her career. And a love of books and writing is what led her to publishing. And uh, uh, it is what sustains her even today. So it's uh, fantastic to have you with us, uh, Sangha. We have a lot of writers who come through and we get a lot of, uh, 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 you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, we get the occasional literary agent, but um, there's a really rich, vast amount of experience that you get. But, you know, that was very nice, like, okay, executive editor and rights manager, but exactly what do you do? Karte kya ho? Right. So, first of all, I'm just thrilled to be here, Chetan, and I'm so glad that you have this community. I mean, even hearing you speak about the people, people who join in regularly, who do things simply out of the passion of, of it is, it's just a unique thing. So thank you for having me here and thank you for, thank you to everyone for showing up to, you know, listen in uh, mm -hmm. my chat. So yes, executive editor, like is a designation, but basically what it means is that I'm a, a senior member of the editorial team. So, which happens when you've been in a publishing house for a long time and done a lot of books, you kind of become a senior member of the editorial team. Uh, but in publishing, in Indian publishing, at least like all of us pretty much uh, do the same thing, which is that we go out there, we look for books that uh, we think readers want to read. We look at subjects that are of interest. Uh, so we keep a keen eye on the news, maybe or general like popular culture and see, ki, you know, what is it that people are responding to? Yeah. And we look for writers who we think are going to be able to write on those subjects. And we approach those writers. I mean, this is all that I do as well, specifically. And uh, we ask them to, you know, um, work on a book and uh, communicate their ideas that they have to the world. We guide them through that process. And uh, then there are manuscripts that come to us through agents, through writers directly. So um, there's, there's also that, like evaluating those manuscripts and seeing, because of course, as much as we would like, <laughs> there are a lot of really great manuscripts that come to us, but uh, a publishing program can only accommodate that many books in a year. So to pick and choose is a task and it's it's tough. Uh, so you decide what is the best thing to publish at a certain time and um, hope and pray and give your all to the book with the writer. You hold their hand and make sure that, you know, what they want to say to the world, what they want to convey through their book, you are able to give them the support to make that happen. And... Um, that's pretty much an editor's role, whether it's an executive editor or an acquisitions editor, like we all do that. So uh, that's pretty much it in terms of editorial. Of course, like there's the actual edit of it. Then there's working with marketing to make sure the book reaches people. All of us wear a lot of hats and we are constantly juggling different uh, roles within Indian publishing. Westland is a smaller publishing house. So we have to... Uh, you know, work with different departments to make sure that the book that 
we believe in uh, is reaches the right readers. So that's also a part of my job to work with marketing and to um, you know make sure that uh, the readers for uh, say a book like Who Killed Musewala might not be the same as the readers for um, The Return of Farazali. And I say these two books because they came out very recently and I published both of them. So uh, to, one thing is to love a book and to publish it. And the second thing is to present it to the world. Like how you pitch the book to your readers is also important. So these are all the things that I do in my role here as, as an editor. But the second part of my job is to be a rights manager. So when we sign on an author, when an author gives us their manuscript, they basically are giving us the right to publish the manuscript as a book, as an ebook, and as an audio book. So mostly that's the like trio that is definitely a, a part of the deal because <laughs> with audio books becoming bigger and bigger, we want like, you know, we want that for our uh, authors as well. We want them to reach the uh, listeners of audiobooks. But there are sometimes other rights. Uh, there are translation rights. There are uh, film rights. There might be comic adaptation rights. So there are these various rights that are part of your work as a writer. When you've created a work, you've created a character. Uh, when you're signing up with um, a publishing house, you should look at your contract and see what rights you're signing to them. Like the rights still belong to you. What you're doing in your contract is giving them the license to use those rights for a few years to maybe, you know, maybe you've written a really funny novel, which you think of as a novel, but it has great potential as a comic book. And a publisher can make that happen for you, like put you in touch with the right people and develop it into a comic book. So uh, to explore those rights, to see where, you know, which book could work as in translation, uh, which book could uh, work on screen, to pitch those rights and to help writers get a good deal on their uh, sub-licensing agreements. That's also a part of my job. So that's what I do as a rights manager. All right, wow. So lots of variety in the kind of books that you've edited, right? So there are, uh, like you said, Who Killed Musewala, then there is a book on Sri Devi. So there is, you know, <clears throat> everything from biography to folk writing to nonfiction. And uh, it sounds like from, from what you described that you're also chasing a lot of nonfiction. If you commission someone to write, it's usually nonfiction. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite? I mean, is there one particular genre that you like more than others? Do you mean as a reader or do you mean as an editor? I think as an editor, because I think these folks are more interested in what you know as uh, you know what you're looking for as an editor. So um, it's hard to pick because I'm actually quite a genre agnostic person. Um, as you can see when you look at my list, I have published nonfiction, yeah. I have published uh, commercial fiction and literary fiction. So I'm actually not looking for. Uh, I mean, I don't have a favorite in terms of what I want to publish. Uh, what I do enjoy reading is also actually everything. I mean, if someone tells me that it's an interesting book and if that person's opinion um, matters in terms of their you know, literary recommendations, then I I'll take the book on. If it's an investigative uh, nonfiction, I'll read it. If it's a political biography, I'll read it. So uh, what I do notice that at times when I'm in a reading slump, I, I turn uh, to crime fiction a lot because I feel like that's a genre that, you know, it's a really interesting genre. You can have very um, quick, uh, you know, it, it can give you instant gratification is what I mean. Like in terms of plot, you can see a crime happen and see it being uh, resolved. So that gives you some sort of, that, that, that predictability at times is comforting. And uh, at other times, it can be a deeply layered kind of uh, crime writing as well, where, you know, there is the crime, but then the characters and their inner lives and their motivation. And basically, as an editor, I mean, this ties into what I look for in writing as an editor, which is, you know, like deeply human stories, because mm -hmm. to me, that's the point of writing. That's the point of reading to try and understand, like, you know, why we do the things we do 
So right. sometimes when you look at crime writing and you feel that, okay, some, some really terrible thing happened and you're trying to figure out why it happened and you, uh, you know, the mystery unravels and you get deeper and deeper into someone's mind and you understand their human condition. That's a very, like, uh, very, very interesting thing to me. So stories that tell human stories, like even if it's a business book and it tells you something about, you know, the the founder's vision and why they where they came from, what they did, it, it makes it an intrinsically human story. Then I'm interested in that. So mm. that is what, like, rather than a genre, that's the kind of story that I prefer reading and publishing. Okay. So... so you said a very interesting thing early on. You said that, you know, when you're marketing, obviously a hook in Musewala is very different from a more literary work. That's almost like a nonfiction who done it. So, yeah. uh, so uh, um, what do you think is the difference in the skill that is expected of the writer when they're writing for one genre versus another? Uh, right. You know, I'm so, for example, you know, lots of people feel like, you know, I, I write too directly and I'm not very artsy in my writing. Okay. Mm. So does that matter? I mean, you know, you know, it really does not matter because I do think all of us, um, all writers uh, try to, I mean, they do write the best book that they can write. So everyone has a different way of telling a story. If you and I have, you know, we are part of the same incident or we experience something, the way you will tell the story will be very different from how I will tell the story. Yeah. So maybe uh, I'm going to, say it in a really quick and snappy way because the punchline is important to me maybe you notice things that I didn't and thus you're going to you know be a bit more descriptive and add certain more layers to the story but yeah. that doesn't mean the the story uh is like your story is better than mine it's just a different way of telling a story and just like there are different kinds of writers there are different kinds of readers so yeah. there are readers who prefer the straightforward you know like just no frills kind of writing and for instance, like if if it if we talk about Who Killed Musewala, that's a book that uh, we uh, the I know the writer worked a lot on the research because uh, putting all the data together, it was all out there. But you know, doing the interviews, making sure things were accurate, talking to people who are jailed, uh, police officers, that's a lot of work. So he put in a lot of work, and I know this of other nonfiction writers, especially who sometimes spend like years on research yeah. and then they maybe want to spend only uh, six months in the writing of it because they've stayed with the project for so long already. It's kind of already there in their head and then they produce it. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to literary writers, maybe it's, uh, you know, like The Return of Faraz Ali is a crime novel, for instance. Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, like I said, I love crime. I love that novel. It's a really good novel. So if if anyone wants to just like get there, get deep into a literary crime novel, that's the one I would recommend. But it's a um, it's not a crime novel for readers of say, you know, um, the the quick pacey kind of the Sydney Sheldon type of mm -hmm. crime novels at all. So uh, it, it's not a quick read. It is something that you will have to get into slowly because. I mean, there's a murder, there's a mystery that happens right in like the first chapter, but, uh, and through the book, the mystery unravels and you slowly find out what's happening. But as important as the mystery is the atmosphere in that book and uh, understanding the motivations of the characters and where they come from. So all of that is, uh, uh, you know, a part of the experience. The book is uh, uh, The Return of Faraz Ali. It's by an author called Amina Emmer and a uh, beautiful book. So, um, so, so that's what I mean. Like, I don't think one person's craft is necessarily, um, you know, more evolved than the others. It, it's just, it's, it's a different way of telling a story. So we should be respectful of that and not, you know, uh, I, I know that there are often these, um, perceptions that we have that commercial writing is necessarily like quick writing and perhaps uh, not that much thought goes into the craft but that's simply not true like I know people work a lot in the uh, the crafting of their plot for instance right so so whether it's at the very granular sentence level or if it's at the level of research or at the level of plot um, every writer 
is working hard on their craft. So, sure. yeah. Sure. All right. I think that's also, uh, well, it's encouraging for us as well. Uh, next question, you've been in the industry for a while and I wanted to take a deeper dive into Westland because obviously, you know, we've all had this, we've heard the stories about Westland, but we thought we'd get it straight from the horse's mouth. You've been there, you've been through the ride. So, uh, can you, I mean, you know, without uh, letting out any major trade secrets, but can you tell us broadly what exactly happened with Westland from Amazon now to Pratilipi? Right. So, um, Westland was, I mean, an indie publisher and Amazon uh, wanted to acquire it. I think they wanted to uh, try out physical publishing, like physical book publishing. Right. Uh, this was the only publishing house where they were doing physical books. There is an Amazon publishing in the US, but it's all eBooks. They don't really deal in physical books. So I think this was sort of an experiment to see if, um, if it works. And they were very enthusiastic about it. We were very enthusiastic about it as well to see uh, how things so which uh, pan out. Uh, this was in 2017. Okay. Yeah, so they came in and uh, uh, acquired Westland completely. And we started functioning as an Amazon company, which was uh, good for us because in terms of resources, definitely like we were a really small company. We used to still publish some big name commercial writers like uh, Amish Tripathi, the biggest of them all. Uh, but uh, I mean, if a mammoth like behemoth like Amazon comes and supports you, it's definitely like in terms right. of resources, it helps. So that's how things work. For the next five years, we worked with Amazon. It was a, a learning process because uh, it's a corporate house and you know we had to understand a certain... Uh, ways of working and a lot of it was very useful because uh, in Indian publishing uh, systems are not perhaps as important as it is in corporate uh, the corporate world so uh, some of that came into like the systems the processes that really helped us kind of streamline our processes and uh, yeah so and, and we did some great books when we were in Amazon uh, context one of our uh, you know premium imprints was launched uh, during that time. Eka, our languages imprint, was launched during that time. Red Panda, our children's imprint, was launched during that time. So I do think of that time as a very productive time. And uh, But alas, like five years later, um, also let's not forget there was COVID, so businesses were affected. And perhaps uh, Amazon felt that uh, this was all, that this was as much as they wanted to, um, you know, uh, stay in physical publishing. They decided to fold up and um, that's what they did. So we found out that they are shutting operations and that Western would be um, gone soon, which was a slightly difficult time uh, for everyone. But uh, the good thing is that we've all survived and uh, here we are and most of the team is still intact. And now we are here in Pratilipi, working as Westland. So Pratilipi then, so was the company bought by Pratilipi? Because you're still using the Westland brand name. It's not just that yeah, the people yeah. can start to fresh. So Pratilipi did not uh, buy us uh, as such. They were interested in buying us. But, you know, the, the timelines just weren't going to work because Amazon had a deadline uh, uh, on which they were going to fold operations. And... You know how it is when a company needs to be bought. I mean, there are certain due yeah, processes, due all of that. Exactly. So all of that would have taken time. So that just would not have been possible within the deadline that Amazon had imposed. That uh, Amazon was not going to basically, we, we were not going to be owned by Amazon till that point. So it that, that sale would not have been possible. So we did the next best thing, which is when uh, Amazon shut operations the very next day we joined Pratilipi so the entire team moved to Pratilipi as employees okay. so and we are working as Westland we retain Amazon was really like great about that they've let us keep all our imprints uh, so legally we have those imprints still we have Western which was our company name uh, and which is like the arm of Pratilipi that we are now their trade publishing arm Westland Okay. And we have Eka, we have Trankabar, we have all the uh, imprints now. So we continue to publish as we did. And uh, yeah, 
just no longer with Amazon. That's generous of Mr. Bezos. Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. No, like you were saying, you know, it's always fun to get to the story. And in this yes, conversation, absolutely. I think this I is the story. So yeah, we yeah, wanted yeah. to get to this. But point. I think the bigger story is also, you know, when the shutdown happened, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, Chetan, that it was a, uh, all across the company, it was like we were despondent. We, we didn't know. Uh, it's not just about, um, you know, about your job per se, but books are such a thing, right? Like you work on them. And of course, it's the author's book, but it's also you feel like you're a part of it. So yeah. to think that all these books that we had published would just not exist, like the whole thing would cease to exist altogether was pretty um, harrowing. But the, the real heartening thing, which I think is a great human interest story, is how uh, all across on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, there was such a wave of social media support. So uh, I was very, very heartened because that just uh, shows me that there are readers who care about books. Right. And uh, I hope that those readers, like, you know, continue to buy books, which is the important thing here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, uh, uh, so, so now, uh, you know, from, from being with Amazon, which was like this really big, you know, American corporation with a very different DNA, now you're in a startup really yeah. because Pratilipi is a very different stage of its evolution it's probably where Amazon was in I don't know 2005 or something and right. uh, and it's also a publishing platform which is free as opposed to Amazon where it's not mm -hmm. free Kindle, Kindle is also a publishing platform but it's an online you know it, it's essentially a business mm -hmm. um, so so and it's multilingual so Pratilipi and, and uh, Westland, except for Eka, Westland is not multilingual. It's basically English language publishing. English, yeah. So there seems to be a lot of difference between Pratilipi and Westland. So how does that whole kind of uh, dynamic work out? Do they pretty much leave you alone, let you do your thing, or how does? Uh, and, for and the so, most no, no, part. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but the most important question I wanted to ask was, uh, given this frame. So please talk about that. But given mm -hmm. this frame, also tell us if, as a writer, uh, am I? You know, when should I think about publishing on Pratilipi? Uh, what kind of writer should think about publishing on Pratilipi? And what kind of writer at what stage should think about approaching Westland as a as an author, as a traditional, in the traditional model? So that would really be of in interest. Of course, tell us about the dynamic otherwise. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we are a part of Pratilipi, like I said. Uh, but, of, and we are an interesting part of Pratilipi. We do like communicate with the larger team. So Pratilipi is a self-publishing platform, yes, but it is larger. So they have, and they're growing at a pretty like, you know, tremendous pace. So we have Pratilipi FM, we have Pratilipi Studios, we have Pratilipi Comics, and all these arms of Pratilipi are growing. So, and they all interact with each other. Uh, and we are the trade publishing arm of Pratilipi. We are the old schoolers. I and mean, we're also like older than most of the Pratilipi gang. They're mm -hmm. all like, you know, how the yeah. startup. Uh, folk are so we are the more traditional publishers and uh, but it's just amazing to be a part of this extremely dynamic universe you know where things move so fast and you know there are uh, IP decisions being made like the intellectual property rights like we they don't just acquire something and think of it as a book they think of it in uh, various different ways like oh how many people can it reach? And that comes from, I think, their platform. Their platform mm. has some 2.5 crore uh, users. Oh, wow. And yeah, and they publish in 12 Indian languages. So their strength is Indian regional languages. Right. And uh, that's what I think uh, differentiates us necessarily. Like, uh, we, like you said, we are an English uh, language trade publisher with the exception of ACA. Of, of course, we publish like um, fiction in ACA and nonfiction, but it's a, it's a smaller list. We can't do the kind of publishing that can happen on a self-publishing platform. We can't cater to that kind of readership. Uh, there are authors, for instance, who, um, especially the ones who self-publish even on Kindle, I know they are bursting with ideas and they write furiously and they might write like maybe like five books a year yeah. no traditional publisher can uh, publish five, five books, books by the same author in a year yeah. it's just not going to make business sense 
So, and we're not going to be able to market it. Uh, every publisher will tell you the same thing that it's it's not going to work. We want at least a six month gap between uh, two books by the same author, at least. So, uh, in cases like this, a self publishing platform is a boon, right, for authors uh, who who write that much. Okay. And the great thing about self publishing platforms is also that the reach is tremendous right. because you know while uh, in publishing we were looking at our small readership and bemoaning the fact that most people are not reading. Here was Pratilipi just growing its reader base. Uh, all its users are readers and they're reading in different languages, but just that they're reading in a different format. They're reading mm -hmm. online. So uh, I think uh, traditional publishers kind of uh, sometimes forget to look outside of you know their universe. And uh, they perhaps like there is a lot of conversation about like oh are ebooks going to um, you know somehow uh, just do away with physical books or I don't think it, it works like that. There are uh, people who prefer to read physical books. There are people who prefer to read online. There are people who do both. So uh, it's it's a way of reading that is also like coming up and growing and increasing along with your physical books. So actually you're the, the readers that you, like the, the market is expanding. That's how one should think of it. Right, right. Okay, cool. So in terms of authors now, say I'm a writer and I'm writing in a novel, okay? Mm -hmm. What should be my first port of call? What should I, how should I think about this whole Pratilipi Westland? Or it's not just Pratilipi Westland. I'm thinking of a, an online platform. It could be a Jagannath, it could be a Kindle as opposed to a, a penguin or a or, or hmm. a Westland or a Harper College. Uh, how should I think about it? You know, when should I choose to self-publish? When should I choose to, uh, you know, try and approach a traditional publisher and okay. get that? Also, given the speed and the probability of success, you know. So. Right. So you should think of what really matters to you. If you want the book out immediately or you've written and you really want readers to uh, get their hands on it now, uh, I think self-publishing is a great way to do that because publishing is a very slow process. So you might have written something with, I don't know, like a lot of time and care, but uh, when it actually reaches the publisher, they are going to take their own sweet time to review the book and get back to you. And at, at, at some point, I mean, you can't even be sure whether it's going to be a favorable review or not. No. If they do want to take the book on, they might want to, like, we'll give you feedback and we want, we might want changes. So it's going to take you another year at least to get the book out. So if speed is of the essence, if it's something that you believe in and you think that, okay, my book is ready and I want readers to read it the way it is right now, then uh, self-publishing is the way to go. If you think uh, a book is in uh, regional languages, I would say Pratilipi is the way to go for sure. because the kind of reach that they have in, you know, Marathi, Bengali, Malayalam. I mean, uh, traditional publishers don't have that kind of reach. So uh, I would say, you know, if it's if it's a regional language that you've written in, do consider self-publishing platforms. And Pratilipi is far more. Uh, what can I say? Like uh, it, ha readers recognize Pratilipi far more than they do Kindle in um, Indian cities and towns. Right. So uh, it's uh, it's a very good option. Okay. Um, there is also like the kind of writing that you're doing. If you're doing commercial writing where, you know, episodic um, crime or uh, uh, the, basically like if it's, even if it's a romance or if it's horror and you can maybe do that episodic kind of writing, uh, then again, Pratilipi is a good platform because uh, there is a way to earn from Pratilipi if readers get hooked on to your uh, uh, work. So that again is a great option. Um, but for uh, physical books, I would say what, I mean, if, if you're willing to wait, if you're willing to work with an editor and make sure that, you know, the book that you're putting out there is, uh, you know, in a sense, the best book that it can be, it, it's going to be a slower process, but uh, that's what a, that's what a traditional publisher will offer. They'll give you that marketing support and you'll be able to see your, uh, they'll give you editorial support, they'll give you marketing support, they'll give you sales support. So you'll be able to see your book in its physical form in different places. 
you'll right. be able to walk into your favorite bookstore and see your book and you'll they'll be able to get you reviews so these are the kind of differences i mean at a very basic level um that is i mean the traditional publishers offer vis-a-vis -vis, um digital platforms <laughs> I, I said you can ask questions and like seven of them popped into the box right away <laughs> so okay, okay so we're done with my q a and now we'll take questions from the group so um the first one is from webhav and he's saying that you mentioned that uh, you look out for promising writers to publish. So how do you do that? And where should the writers hang out to get found by Westland editors like yourself? <laughs> well, I think Weber, what, what I mean when I say I'm all, always on the lookout is that I'm always reading, uh, whether it's uh, journals, magazines, newspapers, online. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't always have to be published writing. If you've written a, a very interesting thread on Twitter um, about a certain subject which interest which interests me uh, then I've you know I'm going to reach out to you and I've done that in the past I've read Twitter threads and reached out to people and said hey I think you know you might want to consider writing a book so that's where you you just need to put out your writing wherever you can so whether it's a writing competition whether it's I mean just whichever avenue you see, put your writing out there, like put samples, uh, because if you're doing all that great writing, but you're the only one seeing it, or it's not basically out there, uh, then publishers are not going to be able to find you. Editors are not going to be able to find you. So right. yeah, right away. Okay, great. Next question. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is there any one genre in fiction that Westland does not accept? That's from Shankar. Mm, does not accept? I, I don't think think there's any such genre but you know publishing like one of the things about it is that unfortunately or fortunately I mean it is very market driven right so uh, physical I mean that's one of the things Chetan that uh, online on a digital platform you don't really have to worry about these things but in traditional publishing you have to worry about what sells and what doesn't so a publisher will think about those things before taking your book on so uh, for instance, India does not yet have a very mature um, uh, you know, science fiction market, for instance, or um, um, young adult market. It's small. I mean, there are good books out there, but it's not like you see, a, you see a lot of very interesting writing in those spaces. But I won't say there is any genre that we don't accept work in if your book is that one book in that genre which is stand out then publishers are going to take note in fact you might have a better chance of getting your book published because there aren't too many writers writing in that space what about uh, short story and poetry that's one of the things that come up all the time we do accept short story collections we do accept poetry as well but poetry again because it's such a tiny market mm. we publish very um, few books in a year so we can't accept most of the books that come in. We do review them. And uh, I mean, I'm publishing Manjari Indurkar's poetry in September. We've just published another collection. So we do publish poetry. But again, the the what the advance, the, the monetary value attached to poetry is because we just don't sell poetry, unfortunately. So that that is small. So Lee uh, has a question. Just to give you context, he's a Canadian writer. Uh, okay. And he lives in Bombay with two very naughty motorcycles. Uh, speaking strictly about fiction, I was told by a commissioning editor once that publishing houses in India tend to shy away from manuscripts with too much foreign content. This was later confirmed by a reputable literary agent. What is your or Westland's position on this? You. Mm, I wonder what you mean by foreign content. I'm not very clear on that. Is you it want something to come on and just talk? Um, specifically uh, stories that would deal with um, a large amount of non-Indian characters or perhaps take, take place outside of India. Right. So Lee, it's again, it's the same thing. It's the market. If I, if I put out a book that's set in Turkey with Turkish characters, I don't know how many readers in India would actually want to read that. So uh, it won't make commercial sense for me to publish that book right so that's how it is like even when say i pitch rights for indian books to foreign markets 
it's always like I'll try to see if there is a connection uh, between the book that I'm pitching and the country that I'm pitching to. So if there is a link. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I would be would be heavily would have heavy Indian like there would be Indian characters. A majority of it would take place here, but there would also be uh, a heavy foreign. Say 30, 30, 70. Right. So I'm not sure if that, uh, uh, because I can think of this one book that I'm going to publish later this year, uh, where a lot of the action actually does take uh, place outside of India, but it's very intrinsic to the story. The main story is about Indian characters and uh, the characters then move to a different country and a lot of action takes place uh, there. Uh, so, I mean, if if it's somehow built into the story, then I don't think it should matter. But uh, primarily, the focus should be, I mean, it should be for an Indian market. Yeah, Does that, that sounds question? like Shari Khan going to Switzerland. Though. <laughs> so I don't know if, <laughs> if that's the solution to Lee's uh, question. But um, we, I, I, I guess you heard what you heard. Uh, next question was uh, about uh, why, a, uh, no, the next question was uh, from Anusha. She's saying, at what stage should a writer approach you, short fiction writer specifically? So mostly what I tell people is when you're, especially if it's fiction, that when your work is fully finished and done, right? But Yeah. 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 So for fiction, uh, if it's a novel, then definitely when your work is complete, when your book is complete, uh, that is when you should approach a publisher with some sample chapters. But uh, for short fiction writers, uh, if there are some stories, I mean, if you know where your collection is going, and if you have like say three stories that you're you're very happy with, you can still reach out to a publisher because those stories are complete. So yeah, you can reach out with like three stories and a broader outline of how you think the book is going to be. Yeah, cool. So um, just I just wanted to uh, clarify there. So it's okay to just go with three stories and then build on that theme later is that what you're saying yes for a short story collection yeah if there are three stories and you have a general theme in mind already but you think you want to sign up with a publisher uh based on what you have we can still we will still consider your stories because those stories are complete okay all right yeah. thank yeah. you um this question you partly answered, but uh, the next one is why uh, from Deeksha uh, is why are there barely any YA fantasy books in India? Are there mm, not many writers writing them or lack of market making uh, publishers unwilling to take on such manuscripts? So, yeah, I did talk about this briefly. We are a, a market driven sort of an industry. So, I'm not going to say that Indian youngsters don't read or like people in general, Indian readers don't read uh, YA uh, fantasy, uh, they do, but uh, most of it is international. It's not something, nothing from India has really broken out in that way uh, over the years that like more than a decade that I've been in publishing. So perhaps it is a case of, you know, I don't know, maybe that standout book hasn't happened yet, which is going to change how people feel about YA. So it's it's a very small market for us. And thus we, we do publish in it, but very few books. So if you have that standout book, if you have something which you think is going to just, you know, like uh, knock the socks off everyone, then I mean, do, pitch it to people. I mean, I, I know Westland is open to submissions. We're definitely going to look at it, but the chance of getting a YA novel published is slimmer than other, other genres. Okay, next question is a simple one. At Westland, are you more keen on nonfiction over fiction? No, not at all. I mean, I love fiction personally, and Trankabar as an imprint is an imprint where we only do fiction. So uh, that is our imprint dedicated to fiction. We also publish fiction in context, fiction with a political bent. Um, we also publish fiction in ECA. So there's a lot of fiction. We also publish uh, fiction in Westland, which is like, you know, our eponymous imprint. 
so it uh, we do uh, publish uh, a lot of fiction um, and uh, there is no such you know stepmotherly treatment given to fiction but uh, as for non fiction i think it's easier to um, uh, commission non fiction because uh, fiction we are really dependent on what the writers are writing and what is pitched to us because i can't really go to a fiction writer and say you know i really think you should be writing a book on i don't know uh, uh, family relationships or whatever they are going to write what they want to write what they've been working on I, I think fiction writers the fiction comes from what they want to work on but for non fiction writing you see what's around you you can see writers who are working on similar subjects you can actually go out and ask them to work on something so we end up commissioning a lot of non fiction the fiction we are uh, kind of like dependent on what comes to us from agents and from uh, writers themselves all right cool the next question was um, um <clears throat> what is the typical this is a difficult question what is the typical percent of commissioned books versus slush pile picks so hmm. Hmm. Uh, the slush pile picks are i mean it's hard to give you a clear percentage but the slush pile picks are very very few in number but there are books that have caught eyes uh, got the eye of you know an editor and have ended up being published and that continues to happen in western pretty regularly because all of us go through the slush pile all of us like look at and and sometimes like especially now uh because uh, i don't know like we are a smaller company we are looking at publishing with like a uh, we are looking at publishing with more of a clear eyed focus on what we want to do so uh, i think uh, it, it's not necessary that your book has to come in from an agent i've recently acquired a book which came in through the slush pile um we recently published a book that's doing really well for us which came through uh, came in through the slush pile i'm not going to take any names with this this is true and all of this has happened so i think around like very broadly speaking around 20 30% of our books do come in from the slush pile all right cool uh thanks for that that's interesting um the next one was uh do you have any courses on editing that you suggest hmm i can I mean... suggest one i have one uh, so there's this guy called shani raja he used to be a journalist with uh, economist and he has a, a, a very good course on editing which is on uh, i think coursera uh, so you can look him up s h a n i r a j a he's of uh, sri lankan descent but he's lived and worked in the us or wherever so that's one course i mean it's a little journalistic that's the only thing but i think it's a good it still gives you a good idea of how to go about the editing process interesting that's good to know i mean i uh, only know of the course that seagull uh, publishers they have uh, a course on publishing okay. uh, a short term course i think seagull and uh, then there is um, yoda press they also do um uh, some edit editorial courses i believe okay. so those are to to check out but otherwise like google is your friend i'm sure you can sure, find yeah. many, many names ritu has a question what is the editorial process after manuscript has been accepted we should hmm. actually write a blog about blog about that but anyway go ahead so the editorial process um so you know often what happens is when you sign an author on and the book is already complete they actually expect uh you to quickly publish the book within a month and just show them the cover and get everything done it's don't go in with that uh thought at all or that's not going to happen um it there's typically like a year between you know you when you sign in and when the when the book actually reaches the market and that's a short time frame so it should be anywhere between one year and one and a half years because that's the time your editor needs to work on the book with you so what happens is once the book comes to us so i would have read the book as a reader uh with my acquisitions editor hat on uh, to see whether you know like uh, whether i'm enjoying it whether I, i try to read most books as a reader would not as a you know publisher would to see whether it it makes sense to me whether it holds my interest but when i actually sit down to edit a book then i'm only thinking of it as an editor would right so 
I look at, I, I, I look for mistakes, I look for loopholes, and I look for things that are not right. So the first uh, reading that I do as an editor is give you intensive feedback on uh, what is not working with the manuscript. So, and this is not about the language, it's more about the broader structure, about the plot, about the characters. Sometimes it might be like, you know, this is a really interesting character, but I would like to see more of this person. So, you know, develop this a bit more. And based on that feedback, which takes around a month, the writer then reworks their uh, manuscript. So mostly this is not just a one stage thing. It is, there is a lot of back and forth because I'll ask you to do something. You'll come back and say, no, I don't think so. I think the tone here is perfect. And I'll tell you, no, it's not. So there is a lot of back and forth that happens. There are a lot of conversations that happen. And this sometimes like, you know, stretches from one month to three months, perhaps. So that's your first structural uh, edit. And uh, once we are happy with the structure, the content, the characters, the uh, general like plot, then we move into the copy, the line edit stage where we look at the language, the dialogue more closely, uh, see whether anything needs to change there. Um, so that's your line edit, which again takes a, another month. Then you move into the copy edit stage where you look at repetitions, grammar, things like that, which again takes a month. And a month is what I'm just like, you know, loosely telling you uh, takes us as the publisher, but, uh, or the editor, it'll go back to you. You'll look at it you'll have questions. So it's all like, a, it's a very collaborative process and there's a lot of back and forth that happens. So uh, somewhere after your first round of feedback, structural edit, line edit, we also start parallelly working on the cover of the book in consultation with the authors. So uh, that starts happening too. We send you options. We work on the blurb of the book. So, I mean, all of this happens over a, like a year. So, and at the end of that is when the book is ready. We send it for proofreading after the copy edits are over. We send it to you for a final read somewhere in Westland. I mean, someone in Westland, mostly like the editor who's been working with you. Uh, they also do a final read. And then the book is handed over for production where again, it takes three months uh, for the book to go to press, get ready, get printed, get distributed, reach the shops. So, which is why I'm saying like, be mentally prepared for a for the long haul. It's not going to be an immediate thing. We do crunch titles and sometimes bring something out if it's like, you know, if, if it's a timely book and something needs to come out at a certain time. But otherwise, yeah, this is like the general process workflow that we follow. All right, cool. You know, we have still a lot of questions remaining and uh, um, we, we are actually supposed to stop now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue and we're going to, uh, you know, the maybe we'll stretch for another five minutes and talk a little about the word curve count tracker at six o'clock. But let's keep on with this. Uh, Lee, uh, I'm going to come back to your question. Ram has an interesting question. Do you accept direct submissions or is it better to approach through a literary agent? We accept direct submissions. We read all submissions. So you but can... Would you, would you say the chances are higher if, if you know... Anish the or... chances of hearing a um, uh, hearing back from the publisher definitely quicker if you approach us through an agent. Okay. So Anish especially. So oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't know. It's because that. Anish is a very persistent agent. He's a good agent. Okay. So yeah. That's good news because he's my agent. So. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> is there a genre which is preferred over the others? And how important is it to have artsy flowery language? We already uh, discussed this. Uh, Anupma, why do most publishers not respond? This is after the proposal was evaluated, the manuscript was requested by them. It is soul crushing when there's absolutely no response. Is there a fixed time limit for when a writer should stop holding their breath and move on? Six months, a year? Yeah, it is soul crushing. I totally understand. It is, um, uh, and I can only apologize for myself and for everyone. It's just that we deal with a lot of manuscripts and we also deal with a lot of edits that are happening parallelly and editorial work is also very deep work. So when you're working on something, you really need to focus on it. Sometimes it's it's just a question of time. So if it's a manuscript that the, uh, the editor had requested, it has been evaluated and you're waiting for them to get back, wait for around four weeks or so 
And if they're not getting back, do send them repeated reminders. I always encourage authors to be very persistent with their reminders because there are so many things that I'm supposed to keep track of that sometimes the things that are not as immediate slip through the cracks. So be very persistent, be shameless for the lack of a better word, send in those reminders regularly. And uh, if you're still not hearing from them, uh, then there's a good chance that perhaps they're not considering your manuscript anymore. But I mean, ideally they should be getting back to you and telling you that. Um, there's an interesting question here. Would you consider opening up commission editing for fiction or nonfiction to fresh writers through competitions? So have you ever like used the competition to suss out new talent? So I know that when Western was a part of Amazon, we did have a pen to publish um, a competition that we did with Kindle. Yeah. And then the writers who won that competition were published by Westland. So it has been attempted in the past. Okay. It's um, something that I'm sure can happen again. So why not? Okay, great. Uh, what are some literary agents Westland works with? The usual Anish, suspects? for one. Okay. Yeah, the usual suspects. We work with almost all literary agents. Okay. So where if you do a Google search and whoever the... Uh, names that you encounter, they, so, they are the people we work with. So if you go to the Himalayan Writing Retreat website, there's a comprehensive list of all 13. There you go. I've interviewed all 13 personally. So you're all set. And we're just going to add the number 14. Have you heard of this guy, Salil Sharma? Salil Sharma, no, I haven't. He's mainly a book marketer, but now he's sort of setting up an agency. He's calling it the clueless literary, literary agency. Oh, that's very cute. Yeah. So, um, so have they started submitting and... already? I think so. I think so. But he's still working on a small scale. He's coming more from the marketing place. So that's why. But okay. we'll probably be adding him soon. Yeah, uh, I, he claims that he has got eight or 10 deals done in the last one year. So that's that's fair. It's that's fair. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, does uh, Westland market the book solely or do they expect the authors to pitch it? Mm, Western markets the heck out of your books. Okay. So we, we have a very good marketing team. Uh, we are very committed to the books that we do. And uh, I've worked in other publishing houses and I know this, that uh, our marketing is great. But as an author, uh, I you cannot afford to not be a part of the marketing process. This is what I have seen. Authors who sort of like head their own marketing uh, efforts, their books are the ones that the marketing team also feels more excited and enthusiastic about. So we are going to market your books irrespective, but uh, it just helps if the author is also pitching in and is enthusiastic. So if if that's what you mean by pitching in, like we will like be pitching you for uh, interviews, for uh, you know, like maybe book signings, and uh, it, it just helps if there is an author who who wants to do those things as well. So yeah, but we'll market your books. Awesome. Um... So, so Webhub's question, what percentage of revenue should you expect as royalty? It's 8%. That's industry norm of Webhub. Uh, I'm just rushing through some of these questions. Do you insist on buybacks by authors if they are lesser known? If they're lesser known? No, not at all. There are lots of debut writers that we publish and we do not insist on buybacks. It's really about like uh, whether we think your book has a market or not. If we think there is, there are sales projections that we can make ourselves, we, we are not going to ask for a buyback at all. Okay, great. Uh, Lee's question is, I think it's a long answer question. So I'm going to leave the question with you and maybe you can shoot an email back. But he's saying, can you give us some clarity on fair use rule in particular mm -hmm. as it relates to music and song titles? Because I remember there was a long conversation that happened about this in one of the FDCs also. So can we, for example, can I take you know Pink Floyd's lyrics and put them in my book? Or do I have to go and take permission from somebody? Or can I use, um, you know, things like that? And can I just put them in my book? Do you know if, you know, would you want so to take on that question? That's a tricky thing. Okay. Um, it's, there is no real fair use in Indian copyright law. So uh, the best thing to do would be to take permission, to reach out to someone and get <laughs> them to okay your use of um, lyrics, especially. Uh, song names even because uh, you never know because there are these uh, big production companies and music com music labels 
uh, who are very territorial about the lyrics of uh, artists because it's big money. And uh, I mean, if you use just a bit of the lyrics with no intent to monetize, uh, you know, those lyrics only, it should be okay, but I would still suggest not to do that. And when it comes to songs and their lyrics, reach out to the uh, production labels and get the permissions because yeah, you don't want to end up in a soup and just have your books withdrawn. When it comes to books, it's different. It's much easier to get permissions. You can uh, offer like a small fee and get the permissions as well. But uh, otherwise, uh, uh, lyrics are a different ball game. So I, I, I mean, the, the answer is much more detailed, but in just a few words, I would say stay away from using lyrics if you can. All right, thanks. That's awesome, Sangamitra. Thank you so much.